Hi there, Tackler. Welcome to Disney Deep Dive, where each week we dive into the history, story, and details of the Disney parks. I'm Leah, and I'm a couple minutes late tonight, so thank you for bearing with me. And usually I am joined right next to me, actually in that chair that I had set up just in case, but by my husband, Stefan. But he is not feeling up to it this evening, so... I am going to be riding solo. And because of that, instead of doing a Disney attraction, I am going to be doing some Mickey pasta or Mickey trivia. Right now we are still using this book, which is Disney trivia from the vault, secrets revealed and questions answered by Dave Smith, who is the chief archivist um, of the Walt Disney archives. So it's a really good book. We've shared it a few times before. So I've selected some questions you can see right there, and I am going to be reading them to you guys tonight. So let me see, make sure I can see the chat. That would be good. Oh, hold on one second. If you are watching live with me, go ahead and leave me a comment and let's see. There we go. All right. Got the chat going. So usually we start with telling our history of each of the rides or attractions. Obviously, I'm not going to do that today, so I'm just going to dive in. If at any point you have questions for me, leave them in the chat box and I will answer them if you're watching live or if you are watching the replay, that is fine as well. And I will try to answer them. I always answer or step in. We answer all the comments and questions and we really appreciate you being here. So. I have selected questions today all about Disneyland, and I have never been to Disneyland. If you have, let me know in the chat box or in the comments. I have only been to Walt Disney World and the parks there, but I thought it would be fun to select Disneyland. And also, the first couple of times we did episodes, we picked really randomly questions that we found interesting, but I thought that it would be better to do questions from a specific park and then I have a pencil so that I can mark the questions that I have asked very lightly with a little check so that we do not repeat. Um, so the first question again this is a Disneyland trivia question it says my kids are excited about a new ride scheduled for Cars Land in 2012 so about seven years ago now but where the ride cars float on air. I recall a flying saucer ride at Disneyland years ago where they had air suspended saucers that operated like a bumper car ride and my memory places it where the teacups ride is now. They say I'm old and crazy, but I remember riding on that ride and how cool it was. Help, Merlin. Okay, that makes me laugh, old and crazy. But flying saucers at Disneyland or was at Disneyland from 1961 to 1966. It was located in Tomorrowland. Because of problems with the technology, still unproven at the time, the attraction had constant maintenance issues and was often broken down. So Merlin wasn't crazy and that ride was at Disneyland. So that's very interesting. All right, next up. And if you have any Comments or questions as I go, let me know, stop me. Also, you guys like my shirt. It says, here, gab, gab, gab. They're always gossiping. It's Timothy Mouse, I love this shirt. Um, okay, question. Someone recently told me that Main Street at Disneyland once included an operating pharmacy. Was any medicinal merchandise ever sold there? And that question comes from Alex Hartford. Um, from Connecticut. And the answer is, and I did not know this, so this is really interesting. Up John Pharmacy was on Main Street, USA from 1955 to 1970. That's super interesting. So that's quite a while. It was primarily a display of what an old fashioned drugstore might look like with old medicine bottles and other. Oh, okay. Okay. Wait, where did I lost my spot? Hold, hold on. Oh, oh, old medicine bottles on the exhibit. Okay. They never sold anything there, but they did hand out free miniature bottles of vitamins. That's interesting. I wonder what kind of vitamins. 
I remember when you used to go, maybe still, if you go into places like GNC, they would have those little chewable vitamin C that tasted like orange, and I would always get one and eat one. Okay, let's go to another one. I think this one's fun. A lot of people love Disney trash cans. They have Disney trash cans, salt and pepper shakers and everything. So the question is, how many trash cans do the Disney parks own? How many of them are in Disneyland? As pass holders, my family goes to the parks quite often, and we're curious as to how many there really are. And that is from a man named Scott, who is California. So I'm assuming that Disneyland is their home park. The parks in California and Florida have approximately 5,400 trash cans, 1,250 of which are at the Disneyland park. These numbers do not include trash cans elsewhere, such as parking lots, resorts, and downtown Disney, which is now Disney Springs. As you are no doubt aware, Imagineers carefully theme the trash cans for the areas which they are located. So the ones in Adventureland, for example, might be painted to look like bamboo, while ones in Frontierland might look like rustic logs. They are pretty cool. It isn't something that we collect, but I think it's fun. I get why people do it. All right, let's see where else did I have marked. Next page, next page. I'm feeling like I'm a, I was live earlier today for a webinar. And so now I'm like, man, lots of live video. I have a conference call tomorrow. All sorts of video happening apparently. Okay. When the Haunted Mansion opened at Disneyland, were there live people who jumped out at you? Now, if you are a regular watcher of our live stream, which we do every single week on Thursday nights at 8 p.m. Eastern Time, it is called Disney Deep Dive, and we actually just did an episode last week for Halloween. So if you saw that, you might know about this, but I thought it was a good question anyway. Were there live people who jumped out at you? I remember going on the attraction as a little girl and having to leave, oh no, via an emergency exit because I was so frightened. And that's from a woman named Tracy in California. It says from time to time, the Haunted Mansion at Disneyland added people to the attraction. Uh, one was a suit of armor. These cast members scared even the most jaded Disneyland guests who'd been through the mansion many times and thought they knew all the special effects. I'm totally that person. I startle easily. I would absolutely scream. Let me know if you would be a uh, <laughs> an easy scare as well. Okay, let's see. I'm having a hard time seeing which ones. There we go. Okay. The next one is, I just won an auction for a Disneyland Skyway bucket. Can you tell me how many buckets are in existence and how many are owned by the public rather than by Disney? Also, are any of the original round buckets still around? I wonder so much. Oh, hello. Hi, Disney's golden boy. Oh, hello, hello. Thank you so much for joining me. Let me know if you, you don't scare easily at all. See, I do. I am... My husband, who's usually with me, he's usually right next to me. He, it's so funny because he will startle me all the time without even trying. I have to take a sip of water. I feel like I might cough. And I think I've startled him. We've been together 11 years. And I think I've startled him twice. I don't know. Not very often, but I definitely startle easily. Have you been on the Haunted Mansion um, in Disneyland? Let me know. <coughs> Excuse me. Ooh, hopefully I don't have a coughing fit because I don't have backup tonight. All right. Um, and if you are wondering, I am, and you're watching the replay, I do hop over to the live chat from time to time. It's really fun. If you ever want to watch live, you can do that. And if you want to comment on the replay as well, I will respond as I can. I usually do the same thing. Oh, that's funny. Okay. Let's see. Oh, okay. Right. I'm going to read that question one more time because I almost forgot what I read. Okay. The woman said that she won a auction for a Disneyland Skyway bucket. Can you tell me how many buckets are in existence? How many are owned by the public rather than by Disney? And are any of the original buckets still around? Um, this is so interesting to me and I would be so curious to know how much she paid for one of those buckets. And I think it's really interesting now because Walt Disney World just had the Skyliner open and then close and then reopen. So I think this is really interesting. And the answer is, 
My guess is that Disney has about 10 of the gondolas. We have no record as to where the others have gone or how many are owned by the public. There were 42 gondolas when the attraction closed in 1994, which is, I mean, that's a long time ago, as 25 years. As far as we know, none of the original round gondolas are still at the company. The gondolas were made by Von Roll, a company that made similar skyways all around the world. That's interesting. Okay, no, I haven't. Seven. Okay. Um, all right. Let's see. I was thinking for the next time we do this, and let me know if you think so too. So I love this book, and it's very interesting. But I was thinking I should try to pull some other Disney trivia, and then we could make it like a game instead of just me reading them. I think this is interesting. I totally geek out about this stuff, but it'd be fun to make it like a game. Okay, let's go on to the next one. If you, the question is, if you are familiar with the scene near the end of Pirates of the Caribbean, where the prisoners are trying to get the jail key from the dog's mouth, I have always wondered, why don't they simply walk out of the open cell door, not more than 10 feet away from them? Is there an explanation, or ex an explanation, excuse me. This is really funny because if you're a big, big Disney nerd or a big Pirates of the Caribbean person, you know that that's a really famous, I mean, people collect the pins specifically of that dog and all the merch and let's, let's read the answer and then we'll get into it a little bit. Um, according to Rhonda Counts, a show producer at Walt Disney Engineering said, quote, this is, this is an example of Imagineer Mark Davis's sense of humor. The pirates in the cell are not very bright. They are so focused on getting the key that they are not aware of the exit next to them. I think that's so funny. It's such a cute nod. And our very first episode of Disney Deep Dive. So if you go, I leave it in the description box or you can just go to our channel, was on the Pirates of the Caribbean. And that one is one of my favorite episodes we ever did just because I love that ride. And I find that ride um, to be fascinating. I love the history. And we talk about Mark Davis a lot. So really, really interesting one if you love that ride. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. The Pirates were not very smart. Exactly. Okay. I'm going to mark this to make sure... I don't repeat, or Stefan doesn't repeat these ever. Okay. Light pencil marking. It's okay. It's my book. Um, I feel like a, a child who's not supposed to be marking up my book, although in college I had lots of high lots of highlighter on my books. Okay. I've always wondered how many candles are on the birthday cake in the ballroom of the haunted mansion. Also, is the decaying portrait in the entrance hall a depiction of the ghost host. And that question is by Daniel. Um, go ahead, if you're watching live, let, leave a comment with your guess because this is a very famous number associated with the ride. I'll let you know that much. Okay. Um, all right, I'm going to read the answer. The National Fantasy Club, now um, Disneyana Fan Club, had your question on a scavenger hunt once, and I found it difficult to count the candles because the candle lights were blinking on and off, the doom buggies moved too fast. But according to Walt Disney Imagineering, there are 13 candles on the cake. I have not heard that the ghost host is pictured anywhere. He's just the narrator. I think it was the ghost host. Yes. And um, I think so. I've heard that also. So I think that's interesting. And that could kind of just be your own opinion. And I think that the 13, it's sort of like, you know, with um, Haunted Mansion and of course with um, Tower of Terror, famous spooky number. So I would agree with that. Let me know what you think in the comments. Okay. Moving right along. Good thing I marked a lot of these because I'm kind of flying through. If you have questions, stop me. Let me know. Okay. The next one is another Pirates one because I just love Pirates of the Caribbean. When Pirates of the Caribbean was remodeled, two new pirates were added at the end. They are trying to push and pull treasure up a ramp. Inside the treasure trove is a painting of Blackbeard that looks exactly like the painting on the wall of Blackbeard's ghost starring Dean Jones. Might this be the actual prop from the movie? And that question is from Keith and Jane of Washington. All right, let's see. Answer on the next page. Let me mark. Doom. Keep it going. Okay. The answer is a framed picture of Blackbeard's ghost as portrayed by Peter 
Ustinov, I think, in the 1968 Disney movie is indeed located in the treasure trove in Pirates of the Caribbean at Disneyland, added during the recent rehab. It is not the actual prop from the film. Hmm. Okay. Can you tell me who came up with the idea of Splash Mountain? We have spent a vacation at Disneyland and it was my favorite attraction. That is from D.S. Fairbanks of Arkansas. Splash Mountain was the idea of Disney Imagineer Tony Baxter, who came up with the idea in 1983 while stuck in his car during rush hour traffic. <laughs> Relatable. Okay. The attraction opened at Disneyland in 1989. It is based on Disney's 1946 feature, Song of the South. New versions opened at Walt Disney World and Tokyo Disneyland in 1992. So that's a good, interesting one. I know people love Splash Mountain, and there's always questions about that ride. That's one of those rides that's got a huge following. People collect pins and merch and all sorts of things for that ride. So it's pretty cool to think that Tony Baxter was sitting in his car you know, trying to get through <laughs> rush hour traffic and uh, came up with the idea. All right. This one I thought was interesting because this is so long ago. Um, you know, we're approaching 2020 and this question is about something from 1996. So I, it struck, stood out to me. And so I decided to read it. And this book, because if you might be wondering, because I am wondering. So this book, which is Disney trivia from the vault, secrets revealed and questions answered copyright 2012 but the question is in the summer of 1996 issue of disney magazine you answered a question about a bear named rufus who sleeps in a cave on splash mountain didn't rufus run the lights at country bear jamboree show and the answer is rufus has been around ever since bear country was created at disneyland in 1972 there was a snoring bear in a cave near the entrance to Bear Country, and he was named Rufus. When a Christmas version of Country Bear Jamboree show was added in 1984, Rufus was used as the, as the name of a not-quite-all-bear stage manager. The name has been used for other bear characters. So Rufus is the name they use for many of the Country Bear bears and i'm going over to the live chat that it's my birth year i'm assuming you mean 1996 and if so <laughs> you're so young oh you're so young um okay let's let's keep going after that good gravy all right um question i remember the ride american sings in tomorrowland at disneyland I noticed that some of the animals on Splash Mountain look like the ones that were on America Sings. Did the critters from America Sings move? And that question is from Monica. I meant 2012. 2012 is your birth year. Are you seven? Oh boy. Okay. Let's see. Oh yeah. Um, so they did indeed. Many of the audio animatronic characters from the closed America Sings attraction were renovated and placed in Splash Mountain. Some new ones were also added, namely Briar Bear, Bri or <laughs> Br'er Fox, Br'er Rabbit, and from Song of the South, making it a total of 103 characters. 1996? I'm hopping over to the live chat. Okay. I don't know when your birthday is. 96, 2012, whatever. <laughs> Maybe one of those 80s dates. Oh, I'm 23. Okay. Um, I'm just a little bit less than a decade older than you, but that's okay. I'm glad you're here. Thanks for joining in the live chat. Everyone is welcome. This is a family, family friendly program. So seven or 23 or 32 or a hundred, you're welcome here. All right. Um, oh, I loved this question. This one's really interesting. And um, I didn't know about this. It says, the petrified tree is my favorite thing displayed at Disneyland. Can you tell me more about it? And I thought this was interesting because I have not been to Disneyland. And um, so I, when I read this question, it really struck me and I started looking at pictures. So I wanted to share with you guys in case you were not aware either. The tree is the oldest item at Disneyland. All 
of 75 million years. When Walt Disney saw a petrified tree for sale on private land in Colorado, he knew he had to have it. He purchased it as a gift for his wife, Lily, oh Lillian, for their anniversary in 1956. But rather than keep it at their home, he had it installed next to Rivers of America at Disneyland. I love this. Again, I'm so curious um, about how much he paid for it, like how they moved it, all those things, but that's pretty cool. Yes, the pictures, I mean, it is a petri it's petrified, right? So I, I yeah, but isn't that so funny? And can you imagine getting something like that as a gift? I'm not sure what I would do if Stefan was like, here, here, take this tree. I think I'd say <laughs> I'd rather us spend our money elsewhere, but it is pretty, I mean, 75 million years. That's pretty fascinating. Okay. Ooh, where'd my next one go? Oh yeah, here we go. In the late 1950s and early 1960s, I watched a Walt Disney Presents show that dealt with natural wonders such as geysers, Death Valley, balancing rocks, and natural bridges. I think they showed a balancing rock that actually tottered with an explanation that the rotation of the earth kept it in place so it wouldn't fall. Does this rock still exist? And does it actually totter? Um, it says, you may be thinking of the tottering rock that was in the painted desert area of the original Rainbow Caverns mine train attraction at Disneyland. It was shown on one of the early television shows about the park. The attraction also included geysers and natural bridges. I think this is really sweet. I like the answer and I like the question because I think it's really fun how, and it's especially, um, my generation and generations younger than me, it's not going to be as much of a thing, but for like my parents and certainly grandparents and people like that, they have these memories and it's so fascinating that they may not know, right? Like what was real, what was a show where they saw things. And I think that it's a really cute, cute question. All right. Let's see. Um, oh, I'm going to make sure I mark these so that we are not repeating. Okay. Why are all the horses on King Arthur Carousel at Disneyland white? And the answer is the original King Arthur Carousel at Disneyland in 1955 had horses in repeating rows of six different colors. The colors were gray, black, chestnut, white, tan, and amber. In the mid-1970s, Disney Imagineers decided to change the color scheme to achieve a airier, softer feel, and all the horses were painted white. Pretty simple answer there. I guess it was just they wanted a softer, <laughs> softer look and feel. <clears throat> I like this as a mother of three children. I think this is fascinating. <laughs> a little scary, but um, it says, I am sure that lots of interesting things have happened at Disneyland. Has anyone ever given birth there? And if so, how many times has it happened? Um, I have not read the answer yet. I mean, I know obviously you guys, <laughs> you usually have to trust me. I haven't. I don't know any idea how many, but my guess would be Yes, for sure that's happened and probably more than once. I mean, I would assume for sure more than once. Um, the park has been around for many years. And a uh, fun fact is um, <laughs> my father, who's a retired MD, uh, he once delivered a baby in a car. So babies are born all over the place. Okay. It says sometimes, yeah, sometimes a baby is ready to be born at an unexpected time and there is no opportunity to get the mother to the hospital. There actually have been three babies born at Disneyland, and the latest is in 2002. Um, if you, this book was done in 2012 too, so I suppose it's possible that there have been more, although I don't remember reading or hearing about that, and I do follow a lot of Disney things on um, social media, so I haven't heard about any, at least not in the past couple of years or several years, but so cool. Okay. Um, oh, okay. Who was the first athlete, and they mean professional athlete, to say, I'm going to Disneyland? And when did they say it? The first was Phil Sims of the New York Giants at the Super Bowl in 1987. 
good year, answering the question, now that you've won the Super Bowl, what are you going to do next? Almost all the television commercials were filmed twice, once for Disneyland and once for Disney World. That was a famous campaign and slogan. So, um, yeah, I think that's really sweet. And I like the idea of that being, you know, a young professional athlete's dream. That's pretty cool. Okay. This one I like because Stefan and I did another episode, which of course you can go, you if you want, you can binge all of our Disney deep dive episodes. And we did a, another episode where we talked about the Matterhorn bobsleds. So you can check that out. And this question relates to that. So the question is, I heard a rumor that when the Matterhorn bobsleds ride was being completed at Disneyland Resort, the city of Anaheim's, uh, had a city ordinance prohibiting the building of structures over a certain height. So I heard that Walt Disney installed a basket. Oh yeah. A basketball court. So he could claim that it the area or excuse me, that it was a, an arena to avoid the city ordinance. Is this true? And can I play there? Um, I'm going to wait a second in case anyone watching live um, would like to guess because I think this is a really fun one. So yes, do you think that that is true, that there was a basketball court installed so that they could avoid the height ordinance? It says, well, this is not exactly correct. There is a basketball hoop, not an entire court, inside the Matterhorn. It was put there so that the mountain climbers could have something to occupy. Oh, turning the page, hold on themselves during their breaks. There was no problem with a city ordinance. So that's one of those things, you know, kind of like the game of telephone, you whisper it in someone's ear and it goes all around or like small town gossip, right? Where you hear one thing and then the story gets embellished and changed little by little by little. And it happens with these things too. So I think that's funny. And also now I really wanna teach my kids how to play telephone because I used to love that. That was the best game we ever played in school. Like forget Duck Duck Goose, forget musical chairs. I loved telephone and I loved um, thumbs up, thumbs up, seven up. Loved that. Okay. A little off topic, but good games. Okay. Um, this one um, is just some interesting history. It says, how did Ronald Reagan get picked to host the opening ceremonies at Disneyland? And the answer is that Ronald Reagan, Art Linkletter, and Bob Cummins were selected um, for their host duties at the opening of Disneyland by Walt Disney himself, and all three of them were his friends. So that is pretty, yeah, it's a great time killer. Yeah, it's a good game. Okay. Um, hang on. Where's the next one? Oh, yeah. I thought this one was good because I think it's an interesting thing that people are asking because we actually hear about this happening quite a bit now. Um, and the question is, I heard that Liz Taylor once rented Fantasyland for a private party. Is this true? And that's asked by a woman named Shelly from Omaha, Nebraska. And the answer is Liz Taylor took over Disneyland for an entire after hours 60th birthday bash on February 27th, 1992 through the years in the off seasons. Areas of Disneyland were available for rental to private companies so they could host parties there. But it is rare for an individual to have such a private party. This was also famously done by Kim Kardashian and Kanye West um, and also by um, John Stamos, Uncle Jesse. Um, he's done it. I'm trying to think of other celebrities. I know there are others, but those are two that I know right off the top of my head. I would do that for myself. Someone said that in the live chat. Yeah. If I had tons and tons, if I had Uncle Jesse cash, I would do that too. Um, all right. Okay. Here's one. This is going to be a good one for you to guess. Um, I have my own guess as well. Um, we can do it together because it is the last one on the page and the answer's in the next page. So is it true that the parking structure at Disneyland is the biggest parking structure in the world? How many cars can it hold? My guess is absolutely not, but we'll see. Oh, okay. I'm hopping over to the live chat. Gigi is here. 
<laughs> she says, I'm so sorry I'm late. What did I miss? And where is Stefan? Gigi is a sweet, sweet person. She is also a YouTuber. And she always hops on and watches live with Stefan and I. Yeah, Gigi, Stefan just wasn't feeling up to it tonight. So it's kind of funny because I was doing a webinar, which you know earlier. And then here I am live. So it's just been a, a crazy day of live videos. But um, yeah, we're doing Disney trivia. So we call it Mickey Pasta. And this is from The Vault, this book. I'm doing all Disneyland trivia tonight. And we're also going to grab some um, questions. I think I'm going to use next time we do Mickey Pasta, we're going to do not just from this book. I'm going to pull trivia so we can make it more of a game. I think that would be really fun. Um, so I'll have to... <laughs> I'll have to run that by Stefan, right? I'm like coming up with these things, I'm taking over the show here. But just for tonight, he'll be back next week. And we will keep doing rides and attractions. This is just a fun way to break it up. We like this stuff and we figure we would like to share it with you guys as well. If you have ideas for attractions, let us know um, rides or attractions. But okay, I'm going to read that question again. Oh, yeah. Okay. Is it true that the parking structure at Disneyland is the biggest parking structure? in the world how many cars can it hold my guess is absolutely not um oh thanks so much Gigi okay it says oh, okay all right so I wasn't wrong but I guess I wasn't right either it says with space for over 10,000 cars the Mickey and Friends parking structure is one of the largest in the world it is not the largest though it doesn't say what the largest is but just says is one of Okay. Next question. I heard Walt had an office in Sleeping Beauty Castle at Disneyland. Is this true? If so, where in the castle was it? And that question is from David um, from Monterey, California. It says there is no office in Sleeping Beauty Castle, but Walt did have a small apartment over the fire station on Main Street, USA, where he relaxed and entertained his VIP visitors. Okay, I'm hopping back over to the live chat. Guess false two. All right, yeah. Okay. Yes, it's true. Okay, I love that you guys are guessing. It's so fun. Ooh, yes, you knew about the firehouse. Okay. Um, and that's okay. It's just fun to guess. I love that you guys are participating. And if you're watching the replay, feel free to leave comments, guess however you want to do it, however it is fun for you. Okay, I think that this question is really interesting. It's got a longer answer, so you can guess if you want, or we can just read the answer together. But it is Has Disneyland ever closed? And if it has, when? And this question is from Daniel from Chicago, Illinois. Yay, Midwest. All right. The answer is Disneyland was closed on Mondays during the off season from 1955 to 1957 and on Mondays and Tuesdays from 1958 to 1985. That blows my mind. Not that it was closed in the early days, but that it was closed until the mid 80s. So 35 years ago, um, which doesn't seem like that long ago. And it says the park closed full days for rain 11 times between 1956 and 1992 for the National Day of Mourning for President Kennedy, which was in 63, um, and 2001 for the first time on the terrorist attacks of September 11th. There have been a number of other days when the park closed early because of inclement weather. I knew about the weather. This is a thing that happens as well in Walt Disney World if they are having terrible storms um, that come through sometimes. Um, and I did know that sometimes, um, you know, when a tragic event happens to the nation that there was, you know, they would close. But I, it really shocks me and let me know if it shocks you as well that Mondays and Tuesdays all the way until 1985. Because if you think about how much money they are losing on those days, that or they were losing on those days, that is incredible. Again, the early 50s doesn't surprise me. It was so early in the parks being open, but that shocks me that all the way till 85. Hopping back over to the live chat. <laughs> California gets zero rain. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I think that um, 
for days like that, it obviously makes sense. It just surprises me that it went on that long um, for off season because now we all know Disneyland, Disney World, off season doesn't really exist, right? Crazy. Okay, let's keep it rolling. Okay, I have some old A to E tickets from Disneyland. Is there a way to tell what year they are from? Also, what year did the characters start appearing in the park? And that question is from Paula from Texas. And it says the old ticket books usually had coded dates on them, but the tickets inside did not. If you only have the tickets, sometimes you can narrow down the years because of the attraction listed on them. There have been Disney characters in the park since opening day. Okay. Okay, this is a really long question. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna tr I'm gonna try to read this one. This is this one's one of those ones that I may have to read slowly so that I can make sense of it. One of the main birds in the enchanted tiki room, which shameless plug <laughs> we have talked about before, so check out past Disney deep dives, is Jose. There is also a Jose in the three Caballeros. Is the Jose in the enchanted tiki room? The same Jose as in the three Caballeros. Also, who is the voice of Jose in both the Enchanted Tea Room and the three Caballeros? <laughs> they also seem to have the same personalities. Whew, Bethany, I wonder how long it took you to type out that question because, man, that took me a while to read it. Okay. These are different birds named Jose. In the three Caballeros, it is a Brazilian parrot, Jose Cario. Cario Caroca, whose voice was provided by a man named Jose. Cool. In the Enchanted Tiki Room, the macaw, Jose, was voiced by Wally Bogue, who was the original comedian in the Golden Horseshoe Review. Okay. Hopping back over to the live chat. Did you know that as Disneyland... Wait. On, on the ticket, they stamp random names, and my... First time ever at Disneyland, the name stamp on that day was Gigi. Oh my gosh. Yes. Oh, wow. Okay. That's so cool. That's really, really cool. Okay, that's awesome. All right. Gigi, I didn't know that. That's so special. I love when you get little bits. And I mean, that one wasn't on purpose, Pixie Dust, but that's something to make your trip special. Okay. All right. This is about the monorails and I am a big fan of the monorails. I love, love, love them. I have only been on them at um, Disneyland, but we're going to read this question anyway. Did the Mark III monorails at Disneyland have a fourth color? I remember red, blue, and yellow, but I heard there was a fourth vehicle that was hardly used except for when one of the others was in for repairs. It says there were four colors for the Mark III version of the monorail, <clears throat> excuse me, which began in Disneyland in July 1969. Red, blue, gold, and green. The Mark III monorail, <clears throat> excuse me, the Mark III monorails were replaced by Mark V models beginning in 1986. Their four colors were purple, orange, blue, and red. If you wonder why they skipped Oh, excuse me, the Mark V. Okay. Not Mark V, good grief. The Mark IV, it is because they were only at the Walt Disney World Resorts. Okay. That's kind of cool. Hmm. All right. Next one. I think this is an interesting question. It is who bought the first tickets to Disneyland and the Magic Kingdom, the company or guests? And that question is by a man named, or a woman, I suppose, named Alex from St. Augustine, Florida. Ticket number one for Disneyland, the Magic Kingdom and Epcot, as well as Hong Kong Disneyland are in the Walt Disney World archives. Roy O. Disney bought the original Disneyland ticket. The others were provided to the Disney archives by the parks. That's cool. I think that's special. It's kind of like keeping your your first dollar if you own a coffee shop or a store front. 
Okay, I'm hopping back over to live chat. Okay. Gigi, do you know what year that was when you first went to Disneyland? I would be curious. Yes, Gigi, they do. And I love that. I think it's so fun to get to ask people questions. Um, actually, we it was really funny. We had when we were there with the kids, so many waiters and waitresses who were from Michigan. So we thought that was really, really fun. And of course, great conversation piece. March 2013. Okay. Very cool. All right. Cruising right along tonight, even without Stefan. Just can't lose my voice, but I miss him. It's I appreciate you guys who are watching live with me and watching the replay because it makes it uh more fun. Okay. Let's see. Oh, okay. This is a really, I like this one as well. I like all of them. What is currently inside the space that was once Walt's apartment above the Disneyland fire station? Walt's apartment above the Disneyland fire station is still there and is still used occasionally by Disney family members and Disneyland executives. It is still furnished similarly to the time when Walt used it. One major change, there used to be a fire pole from the apartment down to the fire station that is no longer there. I like that. I like that they keep it um, special and like an homage to Walt. I think that's really nice. I really like that as well. If you've watched some of our other Disney deep dive episodes where especially a lot of the attractions that we've talked about, Walt passed away suddenly during the creation of the rides. And so... It was really cool to see the different ways that they paid um, respect and homage and tribute to him by keeping his ideas or trying to keep the spirit alive or do things dedicated to him. I think that's really cool. Okay. <laughs> okay, I'm going to answer this one again because, or not again, but I'm going to answer another Pirates one because I think that Pirates of the Caribbean is a great ride and it's also my think my favorite definitely one of my favorite this is our 15th Disney deep dive and I loved that one so much so pirate it says why is Disneyland's Pirates of the Caribbean different than the one at Walt Disney World I'm guaranteeing right now that the answer to this will be I'm sure good and succinct and to the point but if you want to get really, really detailed about the differences and how they came to be and the storylines and the plots and everything, watch that episode. It was episode one of Disney Deep Dive. But the answer is Pirates of the Caribbean at Disneyland is set in southern Louisiana, whereas the Florida version is set in an ancient Spanish oh, in, in the Caribbean. The attraction in Disneyland is several minutes longer, primarily due to an extended haunted grotto experience. Through the queue, or though the queue experience is longer and more thematically rich in Florida. Also, Florida's high water table could only permit one waterfall to be constructed. Two waterfalls were necessary at Disneyland, where the flume drop sends guests to a lower level in order to pass underneath the park's railroad tracks. So this is something we've talked about before. A lot of times things that become such a part of attractions and rides at Disneyland are things that they do because they have to work with the space they have. They have to work with the buildings they have. They will repurpose things. They make things work. They make things fit. And so sometimes the rides from one park to another, while very similar and similarly themed and the whole experience is similar, sometimes often almost exactly the same, they will have those little differences. Okay. Oh, okay. Hi. I'm going over the live chat. Watching you while I tackle a 40 minute cardio session. Yes. Okay. Well, hopefully I can be entertaining for you because I know when I'm on the treadmill watching YouTube, I am just hoping for some entertainment. So I will do my best. Although um, this isn't like a, a gossip show or something super fast moving, but I'm going to try for you. Thank you so much for being here. It does mean a lot to me. Okay. Let's see. Yes, Gigi, I know. Indiana Jones, Space Tours, Cars, Pirates, Caribbean, Best Rides. Okay. All right, cool. Okay.
This one I think is interesting, especially um, given that it hasn't changed. This is something that kind of surprises me because it says, do the canoes in Disneyland run on a track or are they free to maneuver how participants wish? Um, this one makes me laugh because there is a ride at a zoo that we take our kids to every year where you get into this boat and it's like you're in an Australian outback and you, but you're on a, you know, there's a guardrail and it keeps you going and you can't really do anything except for slightly, slightly, slightly rock the boat. And I mean, it's two feet of water anyway, so nothing was, would happen. But, um, the answer is no, the canoes do not run on a track. They are steered by the Disney cast members on board, um, with guests helping out with the rowing. So the cast members are actually the ones doing the steering and deciding where it goes, but that's pretty cool. Okay. And this one, again, is a fascinating question, and we see this a lot if you are in Disney Facebook groups and you follow Disney think accounts on Instagram and things like that, you will see this. And it is, um, how are celebrities handled by, or handled when they go to the Disney parks with their families? Um, and the answer is, it has always been the philosophy that every guest is a VIP. So celebrities experience the attractions waiting in the regular queue. Walt Disney used the wait line or wait, wait in line with his guests. When there are high profile guests, such as a top ranking government official and entertainment celebrities that can draw large crowds of onlookers um, and take away from the show, sometimes it's necessary to expedite their entry onto attractions to avoid safety and security risks for themselves and other guests. Also, sometimes you will see them with the VIP tour guides who, I mean, I could hire a VIP tour guide, right? But it's very costly. It's expensive. Um, and this doesn't bother me. I know it bothers some people. It doesn't bother me because I think that they should be able to enjoy this with their family. You know, it's, it's like saying, oh my gosh, I'm not going to go enjoy Disney because some people can't afford to enjoy Disney. Um, you know, they're celebrities of a ton of money. And if they get a VIP experience because of that, it's just like they can go to a fancy restaurant and get a table, you know? Um, and I totally agree that they would be, um, they'd be a distraction, right? And they'd be bothered and hounded and cause a huge disturbance. So better to get them through, um, the line and, you know, it is what it is, but it doesn't bother me a bit. Okay. Great question. I've never thought about celebrities. <laughs> They're handled with care. That's really funny. Um, a lot of times you'll see in the Disney Facebook groups where there'll be a picture like, you know, John Stamos really loves Disney. There'll be a picture of whichever celebrity it is. I have seen pictures of celebrities um, who are standing in lines or at least appearing to stand in part of a line. Um, maybe that's like a fast pass line. I'm not sure. But they definitely aren't just being escorted through. Although those are usually a little bit less, like they're not like the top A celebrity. And of course, it's not going to make sense if you have like, a president or like a sitting someone sitting in an office to be out that could be like dangerous or they might need a security team or something like that okay let's move on we're gonna do a couple of more questions okay this one is a question about a ride that many people love to hate. I happen to love it. I think it's a wonderful ride. It's a great way to rest your feet, cool down. And that is Small World. So let me know in the comments what you think about Small World. Um, actually, Small World is one that's really fun during the holidays because they'll do special decorations there. So just a little tip there if you're interested. What was the origin of It's a Small World in Disneyland? Was that Walt's idea? And that is by Harold from Boise, Idaho. And the answer is Walt had a long, or let me begin that again. Walt had a, <laughs> Walt had long, there we go, had a wish to create an attraction about the children of the world. So when Pepsi Cola requested Disney's help in designing their New York World's Fair Pavilion as a salute to children and UNICEF, the United Nations Children's Fund, Walt sent his Imagineers to work and with the project, and they came up with one of the most popular Disney attractions of all time. It's a classic. You can't deny that. It's a giant following, whether you love it or you hate it. And 
Um, again, the World's Fair, that's something that we have mentioned so many times. It was such an incredible thing and such an important thing that the Imagineers were going to and learning about and all this new technology. Um, so that was something that Walt did. A lot of rides and attractions actually would have these long breaks in development. So they might work on them for a couple of years and then they wouldn't touch them for several years because they were so focused on the World's Fair. Okay, so I'm hopping over to the live chat. It's da 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 decent i think it's walt's dream classic definitely it's not bad the song's annoying like lamb chops okay i love lamb chops gg that touches my heart i remember watching lamb chops as a kid um and yes the song will surely get stuck in your head definitely definitely um and i think i mean you know that our disney small shop is called small world shirts co right the shirt i'm wearing today is not um that by the way it is a shop disney um, or Disney Shore shirt, but yeah, small world shirts sure, go. <laughs> yes, it's iconic. That is it. It is an iconic ride. There you go. Okay, let's do one more question. I'll try to make it a really good one. All right. Let's see. Um... Okay. Have movies ever used Disneyland or Walt Disney World as a location? And that question was asked by Linda of, uh, oh, of British Columbia. Okay. The first non-Disney motion picture to use Disneyland as a location was Universal's 1962 release, 40 Pounds of Trouble, starring Tony Curtis. Um... I do not know that movie. If you do, let me know. But I do know the next one. That Thing You Do, 20th Century Fox, 1996, had some scenes in Disneyland. I know the scenes. And now I really want to watch that movie. If you don't know that movie, it's Tom Hanks. And he manages a band. And they are called The Wonders. Um, they're, and the idea then in the story of the movie is they're the small town band from Pennsylvania. And they become like Beatlemania kind of over night with a one hit wonder song and um one of the uh singers it's kind of like what we were talking about with the athlete he goes to disneyland he takes his girlfriend to disneyland and um i don't really want to sing especially because i do a bit of sore throat but if you look up the song it's like doing that thing you do so good okay and then wait there was another part of that answer let me find it I got distracted by that thing you do. Hmm. Um, oh, had some scenes in Disneyland. And the same year, Marvin's Room used Walt Disney World locations. Um, and yes, I'm hopping over to the live chat. Tony Curtis, as in Jamie Lee Curtis's dad? I suppose so. So yeah, G uh, Gigi, it says that 40 Pounds of Trouble starring Tony Curtis. And that was in 1962. So I'd have to do some Googling or some researching to figure that out. But yeah, that's kind of interesting. Also, I'm about to watch Jamie Lee Curtis because every year at Christmas I watch, um, oh my gosh, her movie with Tim Allen. Now it's slipping my mind, but I love that movie. It's such a, such a great Christmas, a great Christmas movie. All right. So that is it. I really hope you guys, hang on, I'm going to reach down. Hang on one second. I'm coming back. I promise. All right. I hope you guys enjoyed this. Again, I will link this book in the description box. It is packed full. I got it in a Mickey Monthly box, actually. Um, Disney Trivia from the Vault, Secrets Revealed and Questions Answered by Dave Smith. If you guys have any ideas of books or websites or anything and any ideas for a game that you would like to see, not next Disney Deep Dive, but the next time that we do a trivia thing. So sometimes that's if we're traveling, if we haven't researched what we feel is enough because we do, or I should say Stefan, he, oh my goodness, give Stefan so much props and accolades and everything because he deserves it. He researches and writes so much for these scripts every week. So I really do appreciate him and it's hard when he's not there. Yes. Oh my gosh. Christmas with the cranks. I love Christmas with the cranks. Yes, yes, yes. Hopping over the live chat and National Lampoon. Oh no, no, no. Christmas vacation. No, I, oh my gosh. No, Christmas vacation. <gasps> yes, I love Christmas vacation, but no, uh, Jamie Lee Curtis is not in that. 
Um, okay, so I want to thank the liveplace.com. Dean hosts us there. He is so, so wonderful. He streams us as well as a ton of other family friendly Disney and other family streamers. And we really appreciate him hosting us. He's always so kind to us. So please check out the liveplace.com and you can find some other really fantastic people to watch. And I want to thank you for watching and participating. It makes it so much more fun. I love getting to sit here and chat Disney. I feel like I'm just hanging out with you. So it really means a lot to me. Thank you for being here. And if you want to participate and you want to catch us live, we are always live right now. It's at 8 p.m. on Thursdays. And when we change the time, we tell Dean, so he updates the liveplace.com. And I try to share on my social media. You can find me at Leah Tackles on Instagram. And you can find Stefan at Small World Shirts Co. on Instagram. Both are which are linked in the description box. Um, and then I just want to thank you guys so much for watching. Again, keep leaving comments, keep leaving ideas for future videos, and I hope that you have a magical day. Bye.